I have with me today former Foreign Secretary of India, and she was also India's ambassador to the U.S. and China, Ambassador Nirupama Rao. Welcome to the print, ma'am, and thank you for talking to us. Uh, we will be discussing your new book, which is uh, absolutely fascinating because, you know, after having so many books on India, China, this really gives a fresh perspective to things. So your book, The Fractured Himalaya, India, Tibet, China, 1949 to 1962. Um, if I can ask you, um, you know, there's been so much talked about the Himalayas, Tibet being the buffer zone, this, that, but you call it the fractured Himalaya. Why do you say that? Uh, if you can tell our readers and our viewers, and of course, we'll discuss the book at greater length as we speak. Thank you so much, Nainima, for inviting me on this show. Let me just put up a copy of the book uh, for our viewers. Um, in answer to your question, uh, why did I call it the fractured Himalaya? As you know, the Himalayas have been the source of light and spiritual enlightenment and inspiration for millions of Indians through the centuries. And in 1950, 1951, uh, the geopolitics of the region completely changed with the entry of the Chinese into Tibet, the Chinese People's Liberation Army. Mm -hmm. And at that time, our political officer stroke consul general in Lhasa, Sumul Sinha, who figures quite uh, prominently in my story, is one of the cast of fascinating characters that I've listed in the Dramatis mm -hmm. Personae. He said, the Chinese have entered Tibet, the Himalayas no longer exist. So I took inspiration from that. And I also had read a lot of um, uh, literature on the Himalayas, including, you know, the famous Russian explorer Nicholas Rerik and his fascination for the Himalayas. So I somehow wanted to meld uh, this image, imagination in my in my mind about these mountains, and relate it to what happened uh, with the events in Tibet in 1950-1951, which essentially fractured um, an image of these mountains that we had nurtured for centuries. You know, this was our frontier zone. People, linguistic and cultural boundaries flowed over political boundaries. People were in constant touch with each other. Somehow all that changed uh, in the early 1950s. And that's why I call it the fractured Himalaya, because just as the Himalayas became, uh, you know, became what they are today with the collision of the Indian tectonic plate with the Tibetan plateau, similarly, the collision of India and China fractured the Himalaya. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very interesting way of looking at it, ma'am, because, um, and as you have also written in your book, that, that the common perspective that Indians have about Tibet and also about the Himalayas is, is something that is spiritual, that's about divinity and, and other things. But um, I would like to first ask you, um, ma'am, the fact that, you know, you have very clearly stated that, yes, uh, while you have taken a very clinical approach that uh, what, what are the mistakes that former prime minister, our first prime minister, uh, Nehru, did in terms of understanding Chinese moves, uh, what they are trying to do at that point of time. He was also under a lot of challenges, I mean, domestic challenges. So probably he could not read the Chinese uh, moves properly. But you said uh, in your book that those so-called follies uh, cannot be the simple default answer or probably the textbook gospel. Now, why do you say that? Because in the current uh, discourse of things, ma'am, when we are already, as we speak, we are engaged in a bitter st border standoff with uh, China, every finger is, is constantly pointing towards the, the mistakes, uh, quote unquote, mistakes uh, Prime Minister Nehru did in terms of understanding historically uh, that things would be going wrong. So your take on that, please. Uh, yes, an animal. Today we have the benefit of hindsight, naturally, because six, six and a half decades have intervened since the narrative that I have focused on in my book. But the central point of the argument that I make that I don't, first of all, I don't belong to the industry that you can label blame Nehru. I don't belong to that. So I must, uh, you know, say that in, in, in uh, full disclosure at the beginning. I believe that no simplistic deductions can be made about the role and the contributions of Jawaharlal Nehru to this India-China 
Tibet problem, which I call a three-body problem in some ways. Yes. The narrative that I have, um, you know, uh, sought to explain is a complex one. I believe we can't take a narrow or circumscribed view of Nehru. No doubt, Nehru is the central character in my narrative. You know, it, he's a kind of a, a kind of a tragic hero. I believe a very flawed hero with all his faults, but somehow I believe somebody whose patriotism and whose dedication to the national cause could not uh, be uh, be suspected or questioned now you must understand although this was a period marked by weaknesses in policy oversight and in policy making we have to understand the circumstances in which nehru made those decisions uh, the nation was a very young one we were still consolidating that nationhood there were numerous internal challenges that we faced there were uh, challenges of development there were challenges of poverty alleviation there was the challenge of just rebuilding the country after the ravages of colonial domination for almost 3 centuries it is true that nehru was very idealistic about china he kind of envisioned a partnership of civilizations he was not a bismarck he was not a kissinger uh, he saw china as an emergent nation and equal for india at the same time you refer to this mistakes you know that we are still confronted with as far as our china policy and dealing with china on the borders is concerned i also try to explain in my narrative that although nehru was not a strategist he also felt that we should not let china take the upper hand and the basic challenge in asia across the spine of asia as he very figuratively put it was the challenge between india and china and how he dealt with that challenge was essentially along the borders Uh, in the area which is covered by the macmahon line the arunachal pradesh tibet border he took steps to consolidate our presence administration was extended right up to the frontier so some degree of focus and attention and concentration was really applied to that sector of the border it's actually in the ladakh sector in the area covered by aksai chin where we did not pay similar attention and there are various reasons for that we can perhaps discuss it in the course of our conversation and also nehru took the approach that our borders were fixed they were determined they were defined and nobody could question them and that of course meant that when the chinese came into aksai chin we saw that uh, quite rightfully because our maps showed that as a violation of our sovereign territory Mm-hmm. Well, that's uh, pretty interesting, ma'am, and also the fact that you know, uh, with Nehru comes the immediate uh, discourse on Aksai Chin. Now we all know what uh, Prime Minister Nehru at that point of time uh, in the 1960s stated about Aksai Chin in India's parliament. Then you know, so many years down the line, in the similar place, we saw Home Minister Amit Shah talking about Aksai Chin. Uh, although perspectives were very different but do you think that is a, a very uh, kind of an emotive issue for the chinese the moment they hear that uh, they somehow go into this defensive and the, the only thing that they can see is waging a war against china because immediately after aksai chin was mentioned uh, we've seen that you know they have taken a very aggressive stance against india i know i'm i'm aware of that and why i have tried to focus on all these issues in my story is so that the audience today and particularly public opinion is able to grasp the complexity of this whole subject that uh, borders are fixed and determined essentially in the normal definition of the term through mutual agreement between two countries particularly international frontiers if they are to be uh, you know fixed determined signed sealed as it were and delivered it has to be precluded or uh, or uh, or uh, you have to have discussions and negotiations that lead to a border settlement and that did not happen in the case of india and china and it followed that disputes arose each side 
put forward claims to certain territory, which the other side saw as its own. So that essentially is at the core of this dispute. Today, we recognize it as a dispute. Earlier, we talked, you know, most of the the vocabulary and the lexicon said it was a border question. It is true. The question of the border is still disputed. Disputed. The fact is it is disputed between India and China. And uh, although today we face this uh, this uh, advance, this expansionist surge on the part of China in the Ladakh sector, in the Western sector of the India-China border along the line of actual control, the Chinese claim line or the Chinese LAC definition of it seems to be advancing westward, which is essentially what happened also in that period I spoke about. The Chinese claim line kept advancing westward. Obviously, there was a problem here. The Chinese built a highway connecting Xinjiang and Tibet, which is the Aksai Chin Highway, which is we all know the famous Aksai Chin Highway. And once it was discovered that they had built that highway, uh, the dispute was out in the open and it continues to be out in the open because there's been no border settlement. We've had rounds of negotiations. Uh, a number of uh, rounds, innumerable rounds of negotiations, but we have not as yet arrived at a satisfactory, mutually satisfactory border settlement. Mm -hmm. Uh, One thing, if I can ask you, ma'am, and you have dealt it in your book with several small, interesting stories. Um, I wish I could have discussed all of that, but due to paucity of time, uh, our readers should definitely pick up the book and read it to understand what all uh, is there. But some of the things that only you can answer, because you've you've served in China, you've seen uh, how they sort of behave. in terms of the role that is being played by Tibet or Bhutan, and these are the things that you know uh, keeps coming back. We are seeing now that the Chinese probably settling the the boundary issue with Bhutan. Um, they have settled it with Russia after a lot of turmoil. What do you think is the main reason uh, that they could not settle it with India? India has taken several steps. So many border protocols have been signed. But do you think uh, it is because mainly the Tibet issue? Issue that has become now this monumental ego issue for the Chinese that uh, they will probably never settle the boundary issue with India? Or, uh, how do you see that from your expert uh, opinion? Ma'am? I think generations of Chinese negotiators, just as generations of Indian negotiators, have been brought up uh, on the diet of the history of this dispute. And what the other side did, uh, you know, each side has mutually recriminatory sort of uh, approaches uh, to, to the problem. That's the first point. The second point is that the border protocols that you referred to are essentially protocols and a management regime that we put in place to uh, maintain peace and tranquility along the line of actual control in the border areas and to build confidence. They were in no way uh, part of a border settlement. I think you must uh, understand that. The border settlement was, third point is, the border settlement was focused on in the special representative talks, as you know, the many rounds that that was at the, uh, you know, a politically determined level. So there is that, uh, you know, area of discussion that has proceeded over many, many years uh, with no satisfactory conclusion as yet. However, the second point I made, the border protocols, the management regime really worked quite well from 1993 onwards. And in fact, even before that, for 45 years until June 2020, we had no bloodshed on, on, on the, you know, in the, along the line of actual control. So that is what has broken down today. Uh, it's not, you know, understanding the history of the dispute is very, very important, I feel, to uh, to realize that this whole area, this zone, particularly along the line of actual control, and even as far as the territorial claims of each side are concerned, uh, is still out there. It's not been resolved. And that's why when you said they've resolved with Russia, they've resolved with Nepal, uh, you know, you mentioned Bhutan. I really don't know what the position is real with Bhutan at the moment in terms of uh, both sides concluding, China and Bhutan concluding a border settlement. But the extent of the territorial claims that both sides have in the India-China border dispute is very, very big. And uh, how we are going to 
sort this problem out, we still, I, I still don't see what the future holds in that connection. Because on the Chinese side, particularly, there is such a muscularity and assertiveness and, uh, you know, expansionist urge, I would say. You see it in the maritime environment of the Indo-Pacific and you see it along the land border uh, with India today. So we are dealing with a far more, as I said, assertive China, the extent of Chinese power and the range of Chinese influence is far, far greater than it was in the 1950s and the early 1960s that I refer to in my book. Mm -hmm. And how do you see within this, ma'am, the controversies around how, uh, and you've also dealt at the great length in your book, um, the, the issue around the McMahon line, you know, from 1945, um, that letter written by Mr. Kitson. Uh, till, till today, do you think uh, management of McMahon line has also been um, challenging over the years? And maybe, uh, you know, that could be the first step towards uh, having some kind of a solution? Well, uh, let's, uh, instead of the McMahon line, let's call it the international boundary as India sees it in the Eastern sector. Uh, the Chinese regard uh, this uh, McMahon line as an illegal line. They don't use the term unequal treaties as they did with Russia and some other countries, but they regard it as an illegal line. So there is a dispute really about where the international boundary runs, apart from the line of actual control between India and China. And if you see the Chinese maps that that is quite evident. As far as management of this boundary in the eastern sector is concerned, I believe that you know the today 65, almost 70 years uh, down the line, uh, Arunachal Pradesh is so much a part of the fabric of India, constitutionally and on the ground. Uh, its people are fully, fully integrated uh, with the Indian Union, and there should be no question about that. So I believe that in the eastern sector of the boundary, over the years, we have essentially been able to consolidate, you know, that that integration, which is which, uh, you know, is fully legitimate uh, with the rest of India. So I don't think the management of that line or that boundary is really a problem. There are disputes along the line of actual control in certain pockets, small pockets, not like you see in the Western sector. But we have to be vigilant, uh, eternally vigilant also about the uh, protection and the safeguarding of our national interests and our security in this region. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm coming to the question of Tibet. Now, you uh, write in your book, and rightly so, that uh, the no country in the world questions the Chinese sovereignty over Tibet. And it seems now that, yes, uh, you know, over the years, while the U.S. governments have supported it, there is this uh, lack of support that's happening. It is concerning for the uh, Tibetans, too, uh, as I hear them. And the fact that, you know, uh, somewhere down the line, the Tibetan cause um, is probably getting diluted. I, I may be wrong, but I've uh, recently, you know, uh, had an interaction with the new president of the Tibetan government in exile. Then he tells me that, you know, we need a lot more support, but we also need to, you know, uh, tell our new generations what have happened. So do you think the Tibetan cause is really sort of... Uh, dying out, what do you think India should be doing also in terms of uh, supporting that cause as we had originally did? Or do you think that maybe there is a different approach we need to take now because the global geopolitics is completely changing? Uh, well, first of all, let me put it in the right perspective. Mr. Penpa Sering is the head of the Central Tibetan Administration, as we refer to it, uh, because we've uh, consistently maintained India, while we have granted refuge to hundreds or thousands of uh, Tibetan refugees, and of course, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is a revered uh, figure in India, a spiritually revered figure, uh, not a political presence. You must We must underline that. And that has a lot to do with India's stand and on Tibet. We regard Tibet as a part of China. Uh, we've said over the years that it's an autonomous region, which really translates into being a part of China in the way, you know, the Chinese did, uh, have uh, laid out these things uh, within their country. So uh, as far as the, um, the uh, concerns of uh, the 
refugee community, the Tibetan refugee community in India are concerned. I think India has uh, done a stellar job over the last six uh, decades and more uh, to maintain the civilizational and religious and spiritual identity, the cultural identity of the Tibetans here uh, in, in on our soil, uh, all the people who have taken refuge much more than any other country in the world has done. So uh, if you look at the activities of Tibet House in Delhi, they, you know, they're running these diploma and master's courses in Nalanda Buddhism, which is very closely connected, as you know, to Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, there are a, a photographic exhibitions, cultural activities. So all that, I believe, is, is doing a great deal uh, to bring to the world uh, just the history of the Tibetan people. And I think that is a very important role that India is playing at the moment. You rightly said no country in the world, as I've mentioned, no country in the world really recognizes Tibet as anything but a part of China. And that's the way uh, things have happened since 1950, 1951. So uh, the only way I believe that we can at least educate public opinion across the world about uh, this region called Tibet is to at least bring home to people the rich culture and civilization and religious heritage of the Tibetan people, their language, their culture, all that is being kept alive in India today. Mm -hmm. um, also, now, ma'am, if I can shift a bit um, on that interesting uh, aspect that you've written about the curious case of the consulate in Kashgar, uh, I'm sure not many of us are aware about it. Um, I I was aware about uh, it after reading your book. I've just been seen some lines somewhere, but if you can tell us a bit about this and how that sort of also reflects on what's going on uh, in the bilateral ties between India and China today. Yeah. First of all, Nanima, you know, while I refer to the consulate in Kashgar and also the whole um, unfolding of what we uh, said or did on Tibet, you must understand the practical situation that we faced at that time. There was no way we could have marched into Tibet or, you know, <laughs> Tibet was never ours, at least to begin with. I think that should be, you know, understood by, the, by public opinion in this country. As far as the curious case of the consulate in Kashgar is concerned, uh, we had this office in Kashgar from the British days. Yes. And uh, it was a kind of a, a outpost which dealt with the uh, matters concerning Indian merchants, particularly Kashmiri merchants, uh, Ladakhi merchants who dealt with uh, Xinjiang uh, in terms of trade, there was a constant traffic. And in fact, the Karakoram Pass that is so you know fraught today with uh, differences of opinion between India and China was one of the main thoroughfares that we used uh, for our merchants to, uh, to access uh, Xinjiang and to uh, conduct their trade. In fact, Daulat Beg Oldi essentially uh, memorializes one of the merchants uh, who was famous uh, for using that route. And so there is a history, you know, to all these linkages that Ladakh had with Xinjiang particularly. All that has been closed once the decision, the Chinese took the decision after, you know, there was a lot of tussle going on between India and Pakistan about uh, who would, uh, you know, kind of, inherit the consulate building and properties in Kashgar. Uh, all that was, of course, one part of this show. But the other part of it was the Chinese, obviously, because even then they were paranoid, I believe, about foreign presence in uh, territories along their strategic periphery. And they said they were not ready to uh, accept or to permit a foreign consulate in Kashgar, which is why, you know, that office was closed down. But if we had had that office and, uh, you know, today, of course, foreign consulate, some for the Pakistani consulate operates in Urumqi, but in Kashgar, there are no foreign, uh, there's no foreign consular presence. And uh, we lost that. And that would have been an invaluable link between Ladakh and Xinjiang. Ladakh has essentially lost that access. And today, the Pakistanis, through their occupation of territory in Kashmir, in Pakistan occupied Kashmir, have operated those linkages via the Karakoram Highway, the China Pakistan Economic Corridor, as we know it. And a lot of trade goes into Xinjiang. From from Pakistan. But essentially, India 
as the successor state of the British, you know, also had that uh, that right and that privilege in Xinjiang, which we lost. And in a sense, perhaps the Xinjiang Aksai Chin Highway, uh, you know, uh, the earliest reports of it, of course, surfaced in the media from 1952 onwards. And from in 1955, our, con our trade agent in Gartok, Lakshman Singh Janpangi, wrote about you know this uh, these developments. But perhaps we would have known much earlier on if we had been in Kashgar. But that didn't happen. That's one of the what ifs of history. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So I mean, that's what I was also wondering because when you have a consulate there. I think today the uh, things would have been much different, but yes, I mean, uh, again, as you said, this is about what ifs now. Uh, to shift a bit, ma'am, to understand uh, what is happening in the present day. Now, we saw Prime Minister Modi talking about the fact that when he came to power that, you know, let's just uh, see China from a different perspective. Uh, he understood the challenges and also the fact that, you know, how important it is uh, in terms of uh, having a large uh, export market. Uh, but then we also saw him taking a special approach in terms of having informal summits uh, with the Chinese president. Now, of course, after the border standoff, that is out of question. But at that point of time, we were made to believe that these two informal summits um, are required so that these two leaders of these two different countries, they can have a heart to heart conversation and probably somewhere down the line that will settle and trickle down at the you know level of officials and maybe we'll see some uh, kind of light at the end of the tunnel. But from your perspective, ma'am, and since you know the Chinese psyche so well, uh, how do you see that mechanism? Uh, did it work out well? It's very easy to say, no, it probably failed because we un had a bloodshed in June 2020, which is so unfortunate. But uh, do, you, do you think that was a right approach to do? Because he also somewhere down the line, like Prime Minister Nehru, probably wanted to see the Chinese perspective and the mind from a different aspect. What is your reading on that? Well, I don't think you can fault the government of India and uh, Prime Minister Modi for having reached out uh, to President Xi Jinping and had those informal summits. And both sides had agreed that they should meet at the political level informally to look at the whole terrain of the relationship. So I wouldn't fault that initiative at all from either side. What uh, transpired during those informal summits, we really don't know. Uh, did they consolidate the areas of agreement or did they expose the areas of difference? Uh, did they contribute to the building of strategic trust between the countries or did they really reveal uh, the extent of strategic mistrust between the countries? We really don't know because those uh, we are not privy to those discussions and we will not be perhaps for the next uh, many decades. So uh, what I can say is that from about 2013 onwards, this Chinese, uh, ex uh, the ri rise in Chinese activity and transgressions along the line of actual control, particularly in Ladakh, had increased simultaneously. Uh, the uh, uh, the building of the China-Pakistan economic corridor and the concerns that were raised in India also uh, were a contributory factor to strategic mistrust between the countries. You had transgressions, you had the CPEC. Now, you had uh, the entire Chinese uh, raised assertive profile in the region, the Chinese attitude on the listing of Masood Azhar, for instant, instance, the Chinese attitude on our entry into the nuclear suppliers group. You know, the, the uh, atmosphere in relations was not really, uh, uh, in, uh, there were no positive indicators if you looked at the external uh, environment uh, in the bilateral relationship. So these were all, I think, concerning factors. And the way the Chinese, of course, uh, reacted to Article 370, the, the, the rescinding of Article 370, as far as Jammu and Kashmir were concerned and was concerned, and the changes, of course, the, the um, constitution of the union territories of uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. So we, you know, all that is now uh, the, uh, all the factors uh, that came to light in those few years could all have uh, uh, come together 
uh, to this uh, this very very raised level of strategic mistrust between the two countries. So you, on the one hand, you had the informal summit uh, summits, and on the other hand, you had all these worrisome factors. Now, did the informal summits were they able to address all of this and ensure that uh, that things would not come to the pass? that we saw happening in Galwan. Well, here we can say perhaps the informal summits really uh, did not, uh, were not uh, completely able to, to put a stop to that rise in strategic mistrust between the two countries. So that unfortunately is the sobering conclusion that we have to draw. And today I believe uh, as we look at the differences between India and China, how do we sort them out? I believe that we have to work at it, continue dialogue, try to reduce differences, maintain peace along this uh, line of actual control so that situations like Galwan do not erupt again, because that is the real risk I think we face, the eruption of conflict. And I, it does neither side good for that to happen. So I believe we have to manage this relationship today very, very astutely in a very sober, very restrained, in a very mature manner. Mm -hmm. So, ma'am, that's interesting. And I uh, I'll really um, wanted to ask you on this strategic mistrust part. Now, we are seeing that mistrust component is sort of widening uh, with the fact that India is now uh, very much an integral part of the Indo-Pacific. We are now seeing China having its different kind of alliances, yet we are neighbors. So do you think, and now, of course, there's this new challenge of Afghanistan with the Taliban takeover, the Chinese having a greater influence there uh, through Pakistan. How do you see all these dynamics really working out, as you rightly said, that you know we would not probably know what will happen in decades to come. But in terms of the immediate challenges, what do you think uh, could be the way out? Because uh, more complexities are developing while the past is still there, which is unresolved. Well, uh, first of all, I think uh, although the situation in Afghanistan today, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a just a preliminary reading could indicate, oh, the Chinese are there, they will work with Pakistan and ensure that their interests are protected. I really don't know if the situation is as simple as all that and whether the Chinese are going to be able to manage that situation mm -hmm. or whether they are really willing, you know, to really dabble and get their feet wet, as it were, in, in managing the situation in Afghanistan. We'll have to see because I think their primary concern is to ensure that their strategic uh, territorial peripheries uh, with these countries are managed in a way that the situation there is not disturbed and there are no threats to their national security from the operation of terror groups, etc. Which may be India's concern also, although India's ties with Afghanistan are much more, much more organic and my, I go back far more than anything the Chinese have in Afghanistan. And that's that's a fact and you have to recognize it. Um, uh, well, I, I really would say that, you know, even if even as we think that the Chinese have uh, consolidated their position uh, in the region, they, they are, you know, essentially trying to contain us in our neighborhood. They are not happy, really. I think a lot of studies have revealed this and a lot of analysts have said this. They're not really happy with India's rise, even as they talk in very boilerplate um, uh, manner about the need for peace and uh, coexistence, uh, you know, peaceful coexistence. A peaceful coexistence has such an empty ring to it when the Chinese talk about it today. Today, what do you see along the line of actual control? You see essentially armed coexistence between the two sides. And uh, each side's definition of the status quo is different from the others. So, you know, it's a very, very tangled, very complex situation and requires a lot of care, a lot of, you know, delicate and very expert handling in order to ensure that tensions do not get out of hand, that we are able to manage the situation better. And the agreements and protocols that India and China had over the years to maintain peace and tranquility along the border, in the along the line of actual control, yes, you can say they didn't work because Galwan happened, but they had worked for three decades. There must have been certain loopholes, certain 
uh, areas of weakness in these agreements that we must address. But we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, that's what I feel. We have to look at those agreements and see how we can strengthen them and how we can add to them and how both sides can come to a satisfactory conclusion about how we manage the situation. Because these differences along the line of actual control, if they are allowed to be aggravated further, they are bound to result in further confrontation. And I think we should avoid that because that we've seen how Galvan today has put the relationship back by you know a couple of years at least. And we are now talking of decoupling from China as far as trade is concerned, never mind that it continues to be our largest trading partner in terms of goods and we, and that kind of decoupling cannot happen overnight. So we lo let's look at all these. I think we need, although we say that the status quo has to be restored, that unless the status quo along the line of actual control is restored, we can't have business as usual with the Chinese. I mean, that's the line that the government has taken. But then there are certain practical difficulties also that we are facing as far as, you know, ensuring this very, very clinical, surgical decoupling that, that has not happened, that does not happen so easily. Uh, we have students uh, who study in China who are stranded here at the moment because of the pandemic. Many, many linkages were built up between the two countries in the last three decades, which did not exist during the time of the story I write about uh, in my book, uh, the relationship has evolved so much more in the last three decades. So uh, we can't have, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, just uh, kind of conventional deductions that we normally make uh, looking at the history of the dispute that unless these issues are settled, we can't have relations in, the, in other areas. I don't know how the government is going to handle this because at the practical level, these linkages are there. How do you sever everything? Uh, although, as you said, we are integrally a part of the Indo-Pacific, we always were a part of the Indo-Pacific, but our relations with democracies like the United States, with Japan and Australia have been consolidated further as a result of what happened in Galvan. The Chinese don't like it. They keep parroting this line that the Quad is not good for them. But the Quad has really not worked against them. It's the Chinese who have contributed to polarization in the region because of their actions, not just along the India-China border, but also in the maritime environment of the Indo-Pacific. It may be so that the smaller nations in the region may not really speak out against China as we have uh, because of the problems we face, but there is a lot of apprehension today about the role China is playing and that in many ways contributes contributes to this binary, binary situation, the tensions between China and the US in the region, where uh, essentially we should have had more robust multipolarity as far as the region is concerned, including China. It's not that China should be excluded from the region, but China should understand how to play the rules of the game also. It's, you know, it's not a question of competing with the United States and, uh, you know, making clear to the rest of the region that it's the Chinese model that works and not the American model. All that is really, I think, not going to contribute to, to security, to stability and to progress in the region. So the Chinese have also to understand that there are codes of conduct to be followed. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And when you say that the Chinese need to understand that there are codes of conduct that needs to be followed now. And that's my, my last question to you, ma'am, um, is the fact that when you see the behavior of Chinese President Xi Jinping and his speeches and the way the Communist Party is now shaping up to be, um, it seems that he's going to be the chairman perpetually. Uh, in that kind of a scenario, when China is also expecting a peaceful coexistence, uh, no matter you know what do they mean by it, but by the language of President Xi Jinping, when he talks about the Great uh, Wall of Steel and other things, um, do you think, uh, and somewhere down the line, do you think that is also frightening uh, India's neighbors, uh, while they are also rising, they are also developing Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, 
uh, do you think that it is becoming a trouble for them as well to how to decipher China and also balance it out with India? And also for India, it becomes uh, way more challenging when it comes to managing uh, relations with the neighbors. Ma'am, how do you see all of all of that? And how do you see the CCP sort of shaping up in the next uh, 10, 20 years? Well, Xi Jinping is, has essentially tried to establish a one-man uh, sort of system. Uh, it's not even just a one-party system. It's a one-man system today in, in China. Uh, and he has tried to uh, deepen and intensify the power and the hold that he has uh, on the party, right up to the far-flung regions away from Beijing. But we really don't know. Uh, while he's sought to extend his power, to what extent has that power translated into complete control? And that is a question that people who are experts about the internal politics of China could better answer, perhaps. But, you know, this question mark certainly arises. And uh, the other thing about the Xi Jinping administration and the regime in China is that it has antagonized a lot of the uh, major uh, powers and countries in the region by virtue of its actions beyond Chinese borders and also its actions uh, concerning uh, Taiwan. We don't really know what the future holds for Taiwan today. Although uh, you know the uh, a few weeks ago uh, the uh, the uh, history document of the plenum that had been held spoke of uh, the time and momentum about Taiwan being always on China's side. The word always was inserted where earlier they talked about time and momentum being on China's side. Now it says always. So maybe. Who knows? Maybe Xi Jinping is uh, is incorporating the fact that the rest of the world is deeply concerned about what China's actions concerning Taiwan would be. And by using the word always, he's kind of you know indicating that that these moves on Taiwan may not be as imminent as as we have feared uh, because of Chinese actions. We really don't know because there are big, big question marks and uncertainty about the moves that China is making in the region. On the other hand, within the country, they are drumming up these feelings of hyper-nationalism and uh, patriotic education of the Chinese youth has gone on for the last three decades. So a whole new generation of young Chinese have grown up uh, with these uh, with these views and opinions about China's sovereignty, about safeguarding its territorial frontiers. So the mood is quite; it's a very toxic mix uh, that that exists today in China. So it doesn't reassure you about how these problems, these border problems, will be solved. Uh, it's very different from the time I speak of when a Premier Cho and Lai came to Delhi with a package deal and you know sought to negotiate. Today they don't seem to be in that mood to negotiate or to seek mutually acceptable settlements, which is why it's all very concerning. And in the neighborhood, I think our neighbors also, I'm sure, uh, realize the the way Chinese power and control is being extended within their territorial confines. You've seen it in Sri Lanka uh, with Hambantota, for instance. And, and the extent of uh, Sri Lankan debt today, um, much of it to China, although you know, our neighboring countries would not speak of it in so many words. In Nepal, you know, the whole issue of security along the border with Tibet and the way the Chinese have sought to manage that as a, in, a, in a very intrusive manner. So this, uh, these factors, I'm sure, trouble our neighbors. Uh, Pakistan aside, which essentially is, is becoming, you know, China is trying to create, that's the impression that we we legitimately have all those who observe Chinese actions. I'm not just speaking as an Indian here. China has sought to create the system of tributary states, let us say, in the region. Uh, states that are beholden to China by virtue of economic assistance, by virtue of infrastructural uh, assistance. Uh, just the Chinese presence in all these areas uh, is so, so much more visible and palpable than it ever was in, in previous decades. And it's bound to grow. And I don't believe it. You know, you've seen protests in Pakistan, in Balochistan against Chinese uh, fishing in the area. 
and these you know these cannot be just disregarded as you know something that is manipulated by one party or the other i think it speaks of a of a of a, a, a rise in in discontent about what uh, the chinese are doing in the region and the chinese have to be sensitive to this they have to listen to these signals it's not like dealing with dissent within china with in mm-hmm. with a heavy hand you know if if you are seen as intruding into a country's sovereignty and sovereign decision making i'm sure it cannot go down well uh, for them uh, as far as uh, the future is concerned mm-hmm. well thank you so much ma'am that was fascinating one can go on talking with you for hours on the book but thank you for giving us the time once again we were discussing uh, uh ambassador nirupama rao's new book the fractured himalaya india tibet china from 1949 to 1962 do pick up the book you will learn a lot um and thank you so much ma'am and thank you for all the insights that you've given us please take care thank you so much nanima pleasure thank you.